All right, everybody, welcome to the CSM Mastermind. I'm Andrew Marks, co-founder of Success Hacker and our success coaching training program. We're back for our monthly live webcast today talking about leveraging customer success advocates. This free learning event is brought to you by Success Coaching, the world leader in customer success professional development training with nearly 14,000 students globally. I love every single webcast. That number goes up. Our, our training programs are available in a variety of formats from self-paced online learning to virtual and structure-led boot camps. Uh, we're now accepting registrations for our summer 12-week live coaching programs being offered in conjunction with the University of San Francisco School of Management. We also have a number of standalone courses taught by industry experts, including data-driven decision-making, having difficult conversations, change management for customer success, outcome-based selling, and what successful managers do, a formal multi-week management training and coaching program that is uh, with a customer success slant. Find out more at successcoaching.co. Ashley will also drop the link in chat. For those of you who haven't participated in one of these before, this is a live and unscripted discussion where we dig into a single topic relevant to customer success, regardless of the company that you work for, the scope of your role, or the sizes of the customers that you deal with. We aim to pick topics that are going to be practical and useful to you. The schedule for upcoming events can also be found at successcoaching.co. Click on the events tab at the top of the page to find out more. And we're always looking for suggestions for new topics. So please go ahead and message me direct, directly on LinkedIn. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is recorded and we'll be posting a replay along with a transcription on our website early next week. We will be taking questions later during the webinar, so please don't be shy and use that Q&A button found at the bottom of your screen to ask or upload a question. We're also broadcasting on LinkedIn Live and have somebody monitoring that feed. So if you have questions and you're watching on LinkedIn, please post them and they'll be relayed to us. Also, please make sure to keep all commentary to the chat window. If you do drop a question in the chat window, Ashley will gently remind you to put it into the Q&A for us. There's a lot of thought leadership out there, along with a lot of theories about how to deliver customer success. In this series, we focus on the practical real-world advice, best practices, techniques, and shared experiences from those practicing customer success on a daily basis. And to do that, we invite three panelists to join me for a roundtable discussion. These are people who are great at their craft, and we ask them to share their experiences and perspectives. So without further ado, I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves to y'all, talk a bit about who they are and what they do. Let's get started, as usual, in alphabetical order with Jeff. All right. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, welcome, everyone. I see we have a, a bunch of attendees from Canada. I love to see the, uh, the international presence. Uh, my name is Jeff Justice Williams. I oversee currently the uh, enterprise team at Box. Uh, I have a, a good amount of experience in different sizes of companies, previously at Stack Overflow, uh, at WeWork, at Dropbox, at uh, Meltwater, a few different other companies of, uh, of, of different stages, and am a customer success lover. I mean, I am absolutely a student of the game and, uh, and on my way to eventually, uh, you know, hopefully one day becoming an actual teacher of the game. And maybe, you know, Andrew, I'll be at Stanford with you. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Josh, you're up. Yeah. So hello, everyone. And thanks for having me on again, Andrew. So my name is Josh Zamora. I'm Director of Customer Success Management at ServiceNow. Been here for a couple of years, but been uh, a part of the customer success community for over 10 years now. Um, and I, I, frankly, I just love it. It's a great community to be a part of. Uh, really enjoy getting a chance to meet everyone whenever I can and uh, based here in San Diego. So uh, hello from beautiful San Diego. And I, I'm going to I'm going to give it to you, Andrew. We're at 85 degrees today. So it's a beautiful day here in, in SoCal. Yeah, we're, we're closing in up here in Granite Bay. We're, we're going to be in yeah. the, we're going to be in the low 80s today. So uh, warm but, day. But, but you have you have the most consistent, nice weather. So aside from Hawaii, yeah, a little, little, little bit of jealousy, a little bit of envy. Uh, thanks, Josh. And finally, Natalie. All right. Good day, everyone. It's nice to see uh, people from around the world. I see there's some fellow Canadians. Uh, my name is Natalie Ryerson. I'm enterprise customer success manager at Insight Software. I've been supporting enterprise accounts that live in the Oracle SAP ERP BI world now for about 15 years. 
total customer centric. I love to work with customers and support them and be their advocate. Uh, very fortunate to be part of this panel today with these professional people. I'm originally from Quebec City, so I've seen some people join from Montreal. So hello, everyone from Greensboro, North Carolina. Looking forward to the panel today. Ox, excellent. Once again, we all appreciate your time today. Uh, now let's get to the topic at hand. Customer advocacy enhances the lifetime value of your existing customers, and there are no better people to sell your offerings to others than current customers. Customer advocates can help you execute an internal uh, a, an internal land and expand strategy with existing customer logos and provide warm and qualified leads for new greenfield opportunities, which is what we're going to talk about today. All of this, of course, is predicated on helping your customers achieve their desired outcomes. Customer advocacy isn't just a switch you throw and voila, you have advocates. So what should we be doing to create advocates and what are some of the signs that we should be on the lookout for that indicate that we have someone that is right for being an advocate. I think that's that's a great point. I'll, I'll take it on this one here, Andrew. I think it's all about building business relationship, right? And as you said earlier, it's just not a, a, a switch that you turn on, right? It takes a constant work and contest, a contest, you know, relationship building. Um, it's all about building trust with these uh, organization and listening to you know their business requirements so that we can you know bring them to their business outcomes. And, you know, the higher user adoption, the best uh, advocacy you'll have. And advocacy is your key to penetrate those accounts at multi-level, right? Once there's trust, once there's relationship, you've got the advocacy in there and your champions in there selling on your behalf. So those are some of the key components I've, I try to, to perfect year to year uh, working with these customers. So I'll pass it on to you on that one. Yeah, one of the things that I've actually used in the past uh, is focusing on that that key stakeholder, or it may not be the key stakeholder, but it's somebody influential in the uh, stakeholder chain uh, and, and using the ego card, pulling out the ego mm -hmm. card, saying, what can I do to make you look like the smartest person in the room of course. for for uh, helping us, for driving our adoption, for, for, for you know, for um, for becoming an internal champion for us? Because what? if we can help you achieve what you are trying to achieve, and the get, get help you as an or, as a company get a return on your investment, you're gonna you're gonna look really smart, and that's gonna and your star is gonna rise. So there's uh, let me jump in for a second. So one of the companies I worked for previously, they had this concept of the AAA champion, right? And champion advocate, same sort of deal, right? Someone with access to power, someone that was wanting to advance their career, and someone that was willing to advocate on her behalf, and recognizing those people was one of the most critical factors to being able to establish the the potential for new opportunities and creating the best opportunity for us as post sales representatives to really target in on someone that's will, really going to go to bat for us yeah. and it is a mutual thing right so andrew you said something really good right how can i make you look good um to your bosses how can i make sure that you're achieving your outcomes your goals personally um, those are very intimately tied to the overall success of an account. So if you can find that person, it's absolutely worthwhile to make that effort. And what I've noticed also, Josh, is the level of, of hierarchy within an organization of these champions is all over the map, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not necessarily, of course, yeah, people say C-level, C-level, C-level. You know, finally they sign off on any type of projects, but it could be, you know, many steps below sea levels that are going to be your true champions that know internally where to to go in and to, you know, you know, preach your song. Uh, so never turn down anybody that's below a sea level and underestimate you because they can bring you right there at the top at the decision makers and, and make the project move forward. Yeah, yeah. All, that, all that really boils into that executive confidence, you know, the, the ability to motivate the commercial outcome yep. right to, to to make sure that that point of purchase whether it's an initial sale or an upsell or it's a retention moment that that's that that feels like it's coming from a small a strong decision making point from a strong decision maker that you've empowered and then that also folds into how that customer then says to another customer we've had that we have a, a similar experience we're in the same space we're verticalized let's talk about what's worked well and that relationship it ends up informing your product team as well, because then mm -hmm. you have an understanding of your product is working in a, in, in a great way or it's solving certain problems. But if you're inattentive to the advocates, then 
<laughs> you're going to be an incentive to your own product. Yep. Yeah, I also want to add one other Sorry, thing. Go ahead, Josh. Right. Sorry, Andrew. So one yeah. other thing, and, and something that we're doing here at ServiceNow that's really important is advocacy is, is not just a one-sided thing, right? It's not just someone at the company that's actually uh, speaking on our behalf. It's creating the opportunities for advocacy to occur. And sometimes what we have to do and what we've done here is that we actually make it one of the KPIs for our CSMs to go and find that ad advocate and then create a story that they can pass over to our reference team, right? So advocacy can take many different sh uh, forms and shapes. And if you tie it to a specific activity that your CSMs are doing on a regular basis, then it does breed more opportunity for those advocates to reveal themselves and uh, make it part of the overall culture of engagement as a partnership. I love using advocacy as an OKR, right? Uh, yeah. To make sure that we are we are driving the right behavior. And, and you need to, you know, when, when you really think about this, this isn't about you need you need to push you need to push your own ego to the side. Right. Because it's not about you. It's about the customer, right? Just yeah. like, just like we, we want the customer's star to rise because they're going to pull us along with them. Right. And therefore that's going to pay off for us. Right. But you have to push your ego aside. I, I, I have a, I have a personal experience, a large, huge bank that you would all know. Um, uh, we successfully used advocacy, uh, not, not to, to germinate uh, greenfield opportunities outside of the bank, they actually didn't allow that. They didn't allow us to share that we were a vendor, but they were a huge, huge bank. Um, and and we used we successfully used advocacy uh, in in a land and expand uh, uh, strategy that allowed us to uh, grow from a a single organization within the bank to, by the time I had left, uh, uh, I, this is when I was a business object. By the time I had left nearly five years later, we had 17 different implementations of our, of our product. And we didn't, we didn't sell. We actually leveraged our champions who included the, the VP of the division down to his individual contributors. We leveraged them to sell for us. Yeah. Hey, there was a time uh, previously to being a um, customer success role when I was just basically, you know, acquiring new logos and selling. Back in those days, I worked for an organization called Excel for Apps, and I used to have customers that had been using and, of course, had a great relationship with and using our software that would come to huge trade shows like Oracle Open World or a collaborate event, right? And they would sit in our booth and do the demo not our sales engineer, but the customer, right? Uh, so powerful. And, you know, it, it was just an ask. Hey, John, you're so good with our tool. Would you mind doing a demo right here at Open World? And, you know, let's go have dinner after. And they were just so happy to share their knowledge. And then they would talk to another customer. And I said, well, I'll give you the price sheet and maybe you should sell our software, right? So yeah. it's just a, a powerful thing to leverage, you know, uh, customer advocacy. Hey, yeah. hey Josh, I had a question for you around around the KPIs and and yeah. uh, putting advocacy in. What does that look like for ServiceNow, and and what have you seen work well? Is that like user case studies? Uh, so we we've, we've made it a very broad term, right? So basically, uh -huh. advocacy is, or, or rather, the the reference program that we have is per quarter. Um, you have to have well, actually, per month. Once per month, you have to come up with some user story, some sort of case study, some sort of white paper. And we have I mean, one of the benefits of ServiceNow being as big as we are, right? 17,000 employees. Everyone's got a freaking department that they're working for and a specialty that they're doing. And we have a full-on specialty department that's all about customer references. So what we do is we create a play in our system that is a nomination play that says, hey, we've got this guy, Jeff, over at company XYZ, and he is someone that might, might want to tell a cool story. All we do is make the connection. The, the connection then gets carried through into whatever mechanism that they want to do it in, right? Whether, whether you want to present on our behalf at one of our big conferences, whether you want to write a, a white paper, whether you want to speak on, uh, you know, at, at a webinar or something like this, we give the customers a choice. But the important thing is, is that we're giving the customer the opportunity to show off themselves, not us not us showing off service now, uh, but this person like, you know, Jeff would come in and you'd be able to tell your story. And then the tie-in is the fact that we're helping sponsor that. 
I love that. I mean, it's it's a, it's a huge it's a huge leverage point for a CSM to be able to collect the value of their work that's existing within their actual customer yeah. And, yeah. and learn the different areas that they can then point that towards either uh, other lines of business or to other customers in their book or highlight their own work within the company so that people understand like, the things that they're doing are actually impacting the bottom line because sometimes yeah. CS gets, gets forgotten in that process, right? So, Absolutely, yeah, cool. and that and and you know, customer advocacy. You touched on that, Jeff. Customer advocacy has a can have a pretty significant impact on the bottom line mm. of the company, right? Yeah. It, but because because you're 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 bringing in warm, qualified leads in the process, right? So you're lowering the cost to acquire the customer, and 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 maintaining the unit economics of 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 customer acquisition costs to customer lifetime value. Right? So advocacy is, 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 can be incredibly powerful. And when you can attach yourself, there's where you win, right? You don't win in helping the customer achieve what they're trying to do. I mean, you do win, but, but the, the real win is when you can say, hey, I drove this customer or this cohort of customers to advocacy, and they're now selling for us. They're sitting in our in our, our booths, uh, selling for us with our customers. I love that, by the way. I loved going to and working trade shows where customers, existing customers would come up and would answer questions that prospects had. It was, it's such, so strong, such a, such a, such a strong thing when you're, when you have a prospect that comes up and a customer is answering the question. Um, let's, let's, let's simplify it just a little bit, right? It's, it's not the process that matters. It's the human involvement, the human element that goes yeah. along with, how do I make sure that because the products are the products, right? You can go from product A to product B, company A to company B, but if the human element doesn't exist, then there's no there's no drive, there's no um, momentum to actually tell a story, and the storytelling is the most important part of it. That only comes from really good human interactions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and I want to I want to though I want to circle back to something that we started with because we, we're talking about advocates and how we can use them and where we encounter them. But I think it's really important that, that we're, you know, reiterating that advocacy isn't, doesn't just happen. It, we just don't flip a switch and it happens, right? You have to, you have to create those advocates, right? So, so a couple of the things to think about is the importance of, of adoption. Natalie, you mentioned that. Um, how, how do you correlate customer value to advocacy? You know, and all of those things, you know, how, and then how do you identify who your customer advocates, uh, how do you identify who your customer advocates are? So how do you go about uh, doing that? I mean, we talked about some programs where we can harness the power of advocates, but how do we get to that point? It was, it, 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 first, we'll say that the phrase that we said we were going to say, it depends. It depends. Right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> but it is, I think the, the most yeah, for the, with the most important step to take in that is to understand your customer's journey and what their experience is with your company, with your product. And from there, you know what the, the important milestones or touch points are. And sure, you might want to look at different verticals in different ways, depending on how your, your business is laid out. But if you don't have a sense of what that customer journey looks like and where you have resources applied next to what they're experiencing, then your attempt to try to capture who's an advocate is probably not going to hit nail on. It's probably going to be either slightly off or you're going to have somebody who's just a squeaky wheel who's willing to talk up and that doesn't necessarily represent what your what your experience looks like. So it's an interesting it's an interesting question, Andrew. Um, I'd be curious, Josh and, and Natalie, what, what you guys are thinking about. Yeah, I, I like what you're saying. And, and I think that there's something underlying all of this, right? There's got to be intentionality to all of this. You can't just say, I'm going to create an advocate or I'm going to create an ambassador. I saw one of the questions that popped in there, right? You're not just going to be able to say, I'm creating a champion. There has to be a formal process and a definition of what those things actually mean. And until you can convey this is that and for this particular purpose, and here's how you're going to, how you're going to actually leverage that. Um, willingness of a customer to speak on your behalf, then it's always going to be haphazard. And then it's always going to be, um, you know, a little discombobulated. So you have to define the process and furthermore, make it easy, 
right? So one of the things that we, we've tried to do is ensure that whenever we nominate someone for that reference program, it's a simple process for the customer because no one wants to go through all the the red tape and rigmarole that it takes to just become an ambassador or become a voice or spokesperson for um, our product or for their story. Um, Got to make it super easy for them. Frictionless. Frictionless. By the way, just a reminder, if you have questions, please go ahead and uh, post them in Q&A. We'll start getting the questions here in a few minutes. Uh, let's see. Um so you touched on uh, customer advocacy programs. So I, I agree with you. Customer and customer advocacy programs don't need to be complicated, right? They, and they don't need you don't need any special platforms. Even though there are platforms for customer advocacy, uh, we we talk about in in one of our courses in level two. We talk about the advocacy, and we use the spreadsheet. We use spreadsheets in a simple four by you know two. I'm sorry, two by two matrix. Figure out where your advocates lie and. You know, and not everybody makes a good advocate. Not everybody makes a good external advocate versus an internal advocate, right? There are some people that you might just want to use to do internal advocacy. And there are others that you might want to, you know, be able to put in front of the public, right? And speak at, at, uh, uh, at webinars and trade shows. Yeah, you want an Andrew Marks on the stage, not necessarily a Josh Zamora. Right. Like you want to make sure that you're you're putting the right people into the right situation so that they can have the best effect, not just for you as a brand, but also for them, their own you know, career, their own career uh, development, their own, um, you know, how do I say this? Their own promotion, I guess, is the way I would put it. Right. Well, you need to understand what motivates people and what they want. Right. Mm -hmm. You're going to find that there are customer advocates. Your best cover, customer advocates are the ones that want to be considered thought leaders. Yes. Right? Yeah. And those aren't necessarily going to be your key stakeholder. Aren't going to necessarily be an executive champion, right? Could be an individual contributor that has a freak, has a TikTok channel and that wants to be an advocate, right? Well, if they're saying the right things and they're doing the right things, then you should embrace that. Mm -hmm. What the record, Andrew? I think we need to start a TikTok channel about customer success because I haven't seen that on TikTok. And I there, 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 there is there, 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 time on there. There, there is one. And we're talking, yes. and we're actually talking to an influencer <laughs> about that. So Perfect. funny, 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 you bring that up. Yeah. Um. So, one of the things that we talked about, Josh, um, that uh, uh, in our in our prep call, that I love that you threw out, that uh, of uh, all of the things that we do on the customer success side assumes that your product works right yes uh, otherwise you're spending all of your time apologizing for a crappy product experience or or misset expectations right so yeah. once again back to creating advocacy that you you need to have the right environment for it to happen right once it's it's not just it's not just flipping a switch well we talked about it during the prep call right i spent so much time apologizing there were a couple of companies that i worked for i spent more time apologizing for a really crappy product experience than I actually did doing my job. And that was, it was frustrating for me. It was frustrating for the customer. We weren't able to actually achieve value. We weren't able to actually get to any progress in terms of big milestones. It just undermined the entire experience altogether. Oh, yeah. And having a strong product, forget a strong product, having a product that works, that actually functions the way it's supposed to. And then you can at least get some basic value out of it. But that's the starting point. If you don't have that, advocacy is never going to be able to uh, fill in that gap. Yeah, and you're right, Joss. What you're doing, you're continuously doing, is extinguishing fires, right? So, so yeah. you become like the, the the first person they reach out to. Then you escalate. Then you try to track it. Then you push it, and the answer is delayed. So, it's it is definitely a challenge, you know, when when the product is is not running smoothly and. It kind of put the stick right there in the wheel to build that relationship and build that yeah. customer advocacy. So definitely key to have your, your product working well, right? And and I think the message here is, is that, that that doesn't mean I think the message here is if you're if you're too early stage, don't don't focus on customer advocacy yet. Exactly. Right? Oh, Fo focus yeah. on getting the thing working right. Right? Yeah. Customer advocacy should be the last thing on your mind. Right. Yeah. The, what what you should be doing is 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 providing that customer feedback and hopefully making inc incremental uh, updates and improvements to the product. 
because you, you spending any of your time on customer advocacy, you're just wasting it. It's interesting. I, and I see a question here from Valentina in the, in the chat. Um, I'm not going to answer it directly, Valentina, but I am going to give you an example of a, uh, when I've seen the, the engagement in advocacy as a program sitting within the customer success space and how that then reflected into the product and then sharing product information. Uh, the, the way that it started out was, as you mentioned, Andrew, very simple and direct. You have your CSM working with your customer. You're understanding the deployment process. You're getting an attention to the adoption. You're creating those advocates. You're understanding what advocates consider to be a good engagement. And then the, the, if you have an engagement and advocacy team, that team is actually dedicated to setting up your customer advisory boards, to getting direct feedback about betas and, and, uh, and, and product, uh, product features or product changes. And you're aligning that with marketing and the way that you're taking them into case studies and, uh, and, and public information. But then you also have a component that is your customer zero, which is your actual company. You're customer zero, right? You're the company. And a lot of, a lot of companies you know, drink their own champagne. Some say eat their own dog food. I prefer champagne over dog food. Uh, but they, they also, you'll find different companies don't actually use their product very well. So they have the opportunity to then take that information from their customer and use that as a best practice for their business and best practice for their information around how their product is operating for the customers. So there's a dual, a dual uh, interest, both for the company, self-interest, and for the customer to be able to take that information and flow it through your advocacy program. And, and let's add one other thing, right? Advocacy, advocacy as a whole does not need to be just in, innately positive, right? Positive feedback doesn't always make for good feedback. Sure. Um, you can have great positive feedback, but it doesn't necessarily improve anything or doesn't help make the product better or doesn't help make your experiences better. Sometimes advocacy takes the form of someone just being pissed at you and wanting to fix the product or fix the problem or fix the situation. Those uh I'd rather have a vocal, angry customer than a silent, non-engaged customer any day of the week. Yeah, exactly. We want, we want, we want vocal customers for sure. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, let's actually let's let's get to some of these questions. Um, and once again, if you have a question, please post it in the Q and A, not in the chat. Um, so we have uh, our first question from Alex on LinkedIn Live. Uh, do you think ambassador programs fall in this category or are you focusing on clients that the CSM have a relationship with that they influence directly? And Natalie, looks like you want to jump in on this one first. What, what have you got for, 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 uh, for Alex? Sure. Great, Troy. The question here, Alex. Uh, currently within our organization, it's, it's, it's mostly the CS team, the CSM team, you know, that has these direct relationship with the customer. Uh, but it's not to be said that we're also working to eventually have what we call an, an ambassador program. I have been part of ambassador program and creating them from scratch in my previous roles. And it's definitely something that needs to be customer centric within an organization, right? To have this type of program, it needs that multiple division within your organization have got to be working throughout that ambassador program. And that ambassador program is anything from enhancements of your tool, weakness of your tool, you know, uh, being part of uh, company webinars, being part of company uh, case studies, right? Um, it all brings down to what you're bringing out about the uh, ambassador program. It is a very powerful thing. Uh, I've only seen it at one organization that I've worked in in the past. Uh, hopefully that's something that will be created and embraced within the organization I work right now. Uh, but the to really answer your question, it really starts off right at the beginning with the relationship of the customer success directly with the customer. And that program is just an enhancement part of it, right? But uh, ambassador programs are the same as, I mean, can't, can't, those, can't those be used interchangeably? Isn't an ambassador just the same? It's the same thing as an. A, I believe so. What I've seen in the past, Andrew, is that ambassador programs are official programs. Your organization has, you know, like a customer portal for the ambassadors on your website, right? It's formal, it's there, it's tangible, right? 
uh, advocacy, as I can see right now, is more like a non-tangible thing. It's really, you know, uh, me and my peers working to, you know, advocacy with our customers. Uh, what I've seen in the past, that's how it was. It is, you know, it does, you know, kind of look alike, uh, but on the ambassador's part of it, it's more of a formal, tangible area where we can share the information and have our customers officially engage with peers. That's how I've seen it. It's very powerful. I yeah. think you'd, you'd see advocate, the, the creation of advocates and the advocacy process as part of a program uh, once it evolves to that point. So I, I, I definitely agree with you there, uh, Natalie, because you can see a ambassador program existing where it's only focused on, uh, on providing your product leaders to uh, senior leaders and CIOs. But if you really are building an, exec, uh, a, an advocacy program, then you have the ability to take different levels of people related to how the business is operating and then boil that into different parts of your, of your ambassador program. Josh, anything to add? No, I think you, uh, Natalie and Jeff covered it really well. Um, there's the concept of advocacy, and then there's the programs of ambassadorship, and I think that that's that's a good way of thinking about it, right? We all do amb uh, advocacy, but not everyone is an ambassador. Got it. <clears throat> cool. Thanks, Natalie. Can you hit done on that question? Um, yep. Our next question comes from uh, Valentina. Uh, how and how often do you measure the impact of customer advocacy? And it looks like Josh, you want to you want to jump in? Yeah. On so. So there's two aspects of it, right? It's the internal advocacy measurements that we're doing for our CSMs. And then there's the, for lack of better terminology, the attribution model of what happens whenever someone is an advocate, right? That latter one is really, really difficult to measure. And I think that that one is because it's it's an inferred value add to the sales process. A lot of times it's really difficult to, to create monetary value associated with it. Um, what I will say for that component is that that needs to be built into the overall sales strategy and the overall like understanding of cost of acquisition for each customer, the overall revenue, time to revenue and time to value stuff that happens whenever a sales cycle starts up and ends up. Um, that's a, that's a probably a whole different topic for discussion at some point. As far as the internal measurement of advocacy and what we're doing with the programs that we've done, um, we measure because it's very simple for us, right? We've we've simplified the process of you nominate as a CSM, you nominate an advocate, and then that advocate has the opportunity to leverage one of the different mechanisms to become an actual vocal spokesperson, whether they're on a referral call or reference call with another prospect, whether they're coming on stage and talking at our knowledge conference, whether they're writing a white paper or jumping into one of our community pages. Um, the, the measurement for the CSMs at that point in time is just whether or not they did it. Right? Have they met the minimum requirement of submitting someone to be a advocate? And we measure that quarterly. That metric is actually one of the key components for their bonuses every quarter for, for my team members. And it's one of the easiest way to just get something rolling. The long-term benefit is, is that if you make people thirsty, then they'll drink. You don't have to force them to drink. Um, it's our job to make people thirsty. And part of that is just giving opportunities for people to be vocal and be uh, giving opportunities for people to provide that feedback about the product, about their experience, about what we work with them on. I love that. Hopefully Jeff, that answers Natalie. your question, Valentina. Jeff, Natalie, anything to add? Oh, I mean, I, I can't wait to actually put in some, uh, we have user case studies as a part of our uh, our KPIs and metrics, uh, but we haven't yet looped in advocacy or creating those advocates as a part of it. I think there's a mind state around that as well, where if you're getting these use cases and you're understanding how your product is being adopted within your customer, you should understand the who and how that impacts them. Like we talked about getting that person to their next point in their career because of the things that they're doing successfully, the money that they're saving their company, the efficiencies that they're, they're spinning up between their teams, that's where you're gonna really make a difference. And I, I really like that, that, that Josh, you have this, uh, this program in place to benchmark that where CSMs recognize this is an important activity and this is an important part of the process and this helps me to see success at the end of the day. I love it. 
Not something that we have here where I'm at, but definitely something that we're working on and collaborating, you know, hand in hand with marketing to, to, to get that that out there. Uh, but you're you're right, Jeff, on that point. Yeah. And if you see there's different sizes like service now and, and box, I think there's similar size ish, right? And yet we're operating in completely different ways. And we're we're leveraging on different you know, different activity points, different KPIs. And so, you know, it it really, it depends. Right? It depends. <laughs> well, yeah. You don't have to be, once again, you don't have to be a huge company to have an advocacy program. Right. Yep. I mean, look, yeah. look at us. We have, we have an advocacy program. We have, we have a, a ton of, a ton of references on our website. We have a G2 crowd page where people regularly post uh, feedback and commentary. We we're in the process of recording video testimonials, right? It, it doesn't, it doesn't take, it's it it doesn't take a lot doesn't have to cost a lot either we have a, a shared google sheet where we can uh where we have a list of 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 our advocates that we can engage if we need a reference you know it's it it's it doesn't take a lot it's not expensive yeah but, for the that, record andrew if, if you want me to be an advocate it's going to be expensive Just <laughs> <you know. laughs> that, that is a bare minimum requirement for me all right. Thank, thanks. Thanks for letting me know, Josh. I remember that. Oh, remember that is that is a good point, though. Incentivizing your advocates at a certain point, where of course you're not, you know, you're not trying to buy their advocacy, but where you're rewarding them for the things that that they do. That's that's a huge. It, sometimes it, that's the the small act that people forget is that these these advocates are going out on your behalf in some way, some form, some fashion. Um, even if they show up to your to your demo table and they're doing this for customers. There better be a dinner on the other side of that, you know. <laughs> well, and I think you should. I think you should definitely thank them in different ways. Uh, there are programs. Uh, somebody actually in the chat mentioned Influitive. There are applications that track that sort of thing. I've actually used that before. Um, that that reward you with points that you can then redeem for things. Uh, but your best customer advocates really are the ones that just they want you to be successful, right? Because they 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 want to spread the good word. Because as long as you're successful, you're still going to be producing what they need to make them successful, right? Which goes back to the re, you know it, where all this starts is helping the customer achieve what they're trying to achieve. If I, if I can give you a strong return on your investment, uh, why would you go somewhere else? And why wouldn't you want to tell other people about it? Because the more people that are that get onto the platform, the more people that use your service, as long as it's not impacting me in any way. You know, it doesn't it doesn't impact my service. Then why wouldn't I want more people to use it? It just it it rein, it reinforces the value, and it and it and it reinforces you. You know, it reinforces your business, right? I, I want you to be successful. I want you to keep to 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 uh, keep producing, like in our case, keep producing content, right? That that's because that's value to me as well. Would you agree, Andrew? And you know, for the rest of you guys on this call, right? Would you agree that the best advocates have an emotional attachment to your product or to you as a person, right? There's, there's an emotional investment to something being successful, right? For, for instance, I'll, I'll give you a good example, right? Um, everyone knows Dave Blake over at client success. The guy's fantastic. Love I, I, I love him. Guy. He's really great person, right? Yeah. I, I love their product client success, but I really like him as a person. He's just a, yep great human being yep. and given the opportunity to recommend a customer success platform um i'm gonna nine times out of ten gonna go and recommend client success and this is not a plug he didn't pay me for it he's he's uh probably doesn't even know that i'm doing this but when i have an emotional investment an emotional attachment and not weird right so let's let's take it out of that way yeah, yeah you're getting a little weird on us josh i, don't I know, know where you're going and i'm i'm, I'm trying to avoid that but when you have an emotional attachment, a friendship, something that like you want to you want to endorse people that you like. I'm not the type of person that's going to go on Google reviews or on Yelp and be like, yes, this place is awesome until I've actually invested some sort of emotional weight to the fact that this is a great experience. This was a great product. This was a great restaurant, whatever. Um, and the places that I'm willing to do that for are the ones that have invested in me personally as well. I'd say that the point where you know you have an advocate is where they do something that's either uncomfortable for them, a challenge for them, or outside of their normal scope and zone. 
And it's because yes. of that personal connection that they have to you and to your success or that you've shown to their success that they're willing to say, this is going to be a minor pain for a greater gain. And that's, it's so worth it. Once you, once you realize you've turned that corner, that's where, and to one of the questions in the, in the chat, you know, where do you kind of start with your ambassador program? You start with your truth with that customer. And then you recognize what that journey looks like and put that beside your product and then put a program besides that customer group. Well, like we Natalie, Natalie, that right. What Natalie said at the beginning, right? It's about, you know, the, it all starts with relationship building, right? It all starts with relationship building. I, I also am a huge fan of Dave Blake. Uh, we, we maintain kind of neutrality when it comes to the customer success vendors because uh, our, 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 a total addressable market includes everybody, right? When, regardless of what system you're using, because training is training and, you know, these core skills are these core skills. Uh, but it's the relationship that we have with Dave, for example, that uh, um, has prompted us to become the the kind of de facto platinum sponsor to CS100 every year, all right? Because we just like being there. We like being there with his team and we like we like the 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 environment that they, that they create. So I'm 100% with you, Josh. And, and when somebody asks us about, platforms we throw out every platform form we can think of but client success is always on the list mm -hmm. you know so we have to be we have to be careful about that though i, I will say I'll, add, I'll make it so that this is like a neutral environment uh i had a you know i've i've known nick meta for quite some time and he and i have connected on so many different occasions and one time i went to a new company and you know leading the customer success team i knew that i wanted to implement gainsight and so i told him i said hey I want to implement it. We're going to get it started up and you're going to like, you're going to be so happy that you're going to want to buy me a McLaren. Ended the conversation, two weeks pass, and I still have this next to my desk. Nick sent me this. <laughs> and I was just like, I was like, That's no, this awesome. is small, small touches. That's and I have that right happen. next to me yes. every single day. You know, I've got, I got a great relationship with Nick as well. I I've been working with, you know, we've been talking to Gainsight. I've been known Nick since he started, you know, since he, he started at Gainsight, right? It's all about the relationships, right? It's all about the relationships. So, um, awesome, Valentina. Thank you for the question, Josh. Do me a favor, hit done. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Paige asks, "How do you know if you are ready to start planning or focusing on customer advocacy?" It depends, right? It it depends, is that, is that, but I, oh. but I'd say that like you should always be moving towards that. Right. Yes. And something that I said earlier in our pre-call, directionality is more important than destination. You never arrive at anywhere and say, all right, I did it. I'm done. Never have to do advocacy again. You're always moving towards advocacy. That should be one of the things that you're just targeting as part of just the general experience of customers. Now, and this goes back to the, the topic earlier, if you have a crappy product, then you have to put that on hold for a little yeah. bit. Right. Yeah. And advocacy doesn't need to be an end all you know, it doesn't have to result in an ambassador program like we were talking about earlier. It can be something that is incremental. It can be something that is built up by little pieces. And eventually uh, you have a full on full blown advocacy slash ambassador program. But the little pieces matter. The little things matter. Build out advocacy in every little step. Kind of like we see customer success being a key component of all software companies. Adv advocacy is a key component of customer success in general. Um, it's, it just happens to be an umbrella thing that we want to do. Yeah. I think once you've been able to repeat the process, then, you know, and you've done it intentionally, then, you know, you're ready for a program because you can have a couple of really good CSMs, but that doesn't mean that you're ready for a program. Those CSMs might have great relationships and advocates, but you want to be, you want to recognize what they do to make those advocates and then put that into a process. And once you have that, then you're ready for, for the actual program. Um, cause I've seen people try to, you know, they recognize they have a couple of high performing CSMs who have great relationships. Then guess what? Those CSMs move on, they leave, they go to new accounts and they have no idea how to repeat that. They're like, isn't, I thought, I thought this was an advocate. It's not like that. It's yeah, definitely takes the effort, the long view. We kind of just, we, we, so when we started measuring our NPS, we realized, hey, we need to have an advocacy program because we were getting like nothing but nines and tens. Like, okay, so we want, we're on to something. And at first we were doing, you know, we, 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 would, we would put people down on a list as a reference uh, because we got positive feedback. Uh, but, but then we realized, wow, you know, 
our, our stuff is adding value out here. We, we really need to maybe more formalize an advocacy program. And that's where we began. We rolled out the G2 crowd and uh, 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 page and, and we started doing the recordings of the testimonials and, uh, and things like that. So sometimes it just kind of sneaks up on you. But uh, to your point, Josh, you know, it's the, the wrong time is when you're doing a lot of apologizing for problems yeah. and challenges, exactly. right? Um, awesome. Thanks, Paige. Uh, next question comes from April. April asks, what would be your advice for an organization who has only been doing customer success for the past two years? to adapt in the right way to progress towards successful department to have customer advocacy. Once again, I think it goes back to what we had talked about before. Focus on, focus on customer value, focus on ensuring that the, you know, the customer's getting value that you've, you've, you've done everything you can to make it as frictionless as possible. Uh, drive adoption, all of the things that, uh, you know, result in what you want it to result in, which is a, re which is a, uh, a renewal or an expansion or an uh, upsell. I, it, it, we, we shouldn't be focusing on advocacy. Advocacy is, it's a, um, it's, it's the effect of, it's one of the effects of in ensuring that our customers are getting what they're trying to get out of, out of the investment. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a nuance to April's question here uh, that they've only been doing customer success for the past two years. So if they've only been doing customer success for the past two years, first, I'd be curious what they were doing before customer success. But then also, how big is your team? Like how much investment has your, your company put into customer success if you're still only three, four people wide or you know a small, small but mighty team? Paying attention to the, the and depending on how many customers you're managing, Paying attention to the advocacy part of it is probably going to be more, uh, you know, more compartmentalized to your top line customers and looking at how like how much your most invested customers are repeating that business. Because if you've only had customer success in process for two years, that means most likely you've only renewed everybody once, maybe twice. Um, in, a, in a customer success, true customer success fashion. Or, or, you're, po or you're focused on the top tier of your the top, top segment of your right. of your business right yep yeah. yeah no that makes that makes sense um let's see ashley asks what are your favorite practices for cs that result in increased customer adoption and retention I, I can jump in on that one. Nice. There was a that engagement and advocacy program that I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you think about the purchase funnel, right, and then uh, you know where you 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 engage your customers, then you have their purchase point, and then you have the the ability to retain them, and you hope that those people that you retain become advocates. Look at that in a cycle. They really want your you want to be able to accelerate those different points, right? Where you have a new customer, you want their their point of education to be accelerated by your existing customers and how they're how they're using the products then if they're making that if they're making that retention uh point as a part of their process you want to be able to accelerate them to adopt more so you know it's when you when you've been able to influence the the different motions of commercial activity or growth activity because you're attentive to what your customers are looking for then I think that that's when you've got, you, you're starting to get your cycle and your wheel going a, a little bit, a little bit faster or, or in a more efficient way. So you're actually helping your commercial points to, to, uh, to be activated by it. Now you're, you're approaching I'll, it from, I'll, uh, a, sorry, go ahead, Josh. Go ahead. No, 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 please. I was going to say you're approaching it from a commercial perspective. I was kind of thinking about it from more of a, of a, like a user growth adoption? Well, when, I, when I'm thinking about it from an adoption perspective, I think something that people tend to overlook is that adoption is not is, is driven um, by your ability to enable the change necessary uh, within your customer's organization. 
And I yeah. use that term enable on purpose because as a vendor, you have very little, if any influence over driving adoption. So what your job should be is to, pr is to enable your key stakeholders from the executive champion all the way down to the individual contributors who are raving fans of your product to drive that adoption for you. Yep. And that was something and that, that that example that I made earlier on with that financial institution, that bank, a big part of the success of our strategy was because we found individual contributors that were boots on the ground using our product and we over indexed on the change management programs required to make them feel very uh, uh, enabled with the product. Uh, they became not only did they become these kind of adoption champions for us within the organization, they also ended up deflecting a lot of support tickets because they be almost became a tier one support for us. Natalie, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, uh, you, you said the key word here, enabling. Uh, and a lot of the time, it's going to be a top-down approach, right? You, you enable the, the, the key stakeholders, right, that made the decision to move with your, your organization as a vendor and to make sure that the people under them understand that this is the route that's going to be taken. There has been, you know, lots of, you know, money spent into that. This is our new way of doing it. So it's basically a partnership with those individuals. I mean, there's so much I can do as a CSM for user adoption, right? I can send them right. recording of trainings, rec demos, uh, have, you know, offsite training, online training, but it really has to be a key relationship with those key stakeholders that once they've decided that you are the vendor of choice, this is going to be the way to do things. The message got to definitely go top to down, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they, the, yeah. yeah, exactly. Feature function training is, it's just a, it's a step. It's, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it doesn't equal adoption. Yeah. Right. Josh, did you have something to add? Yeah. So, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping out of my skin okay. to talk about this one. <laughs> so we have, um, <laughs> we service now being what it is, right. And I've seen this at other companies, but we get shelfware a lot of times, right. Customers will get sold 15 different product lines and only use three or four of them. And what I've come to realize is that if we can get an, awareness of what's missing and we're talking about cs programs or, or practices right if awareness breeds decision making awareness breeds discomfort that discomfort then generates a requirement for a decision and then that decision generates change so what we've done is we made csms responsible not for the adoption but for the awareness campaigns of hey you, mr and mrs customer here's our product map here's what you bought Here's what you're using and here's how much your adoption looks like. What are you doing with these other things, right? And I think that that generates more, I think it generates more change for the customer and then creates a better opportunity for customers to come back and say, oh yeah, well, we didn't, we weren't using all this stuff. And now that we're using it, we're starting to see value out of it. Um, I think that that in of itself is a valuable step in the process to create advocacy when you have opportunities to basically give someone, this is all about creating opportunities for someone to become a champion, right? Um, access to power, advancing their career and willing to speak on our behalf as an advocate. Those three AAA champion criteria show up when you create the opportunities for them to show up. And uh, that's, one of the best that's ways so true. Found, yeah. yeah, one Sorry. of the best ways we found is to just create the, like, look at the, look at the product map. What are you using? What are you not using? What are you getting value out of? What are you not getting value out of? Yes, you were sold these things. How can you use them effectively? Yeah. And there's times in the past, Josh, I've had customers, like you said, had no idea they had a particular part of the product, which was some type of distribution tool. You know, they were figuring out got hundreds of reports to send. It's manual. And, you know, my head started tilting. I said, but, but you have the distribution tool here. We got what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah really and we're paying for this and why yeah. nobody ever told us well that's where i come in <laughs> let's review well, all your products and and it just kicked off things you know i mean just it's as if he had bought a brand new tool and had had it for free you know they were tickled to death right um yeah. 
But so, these people, these people like, should be motivated. They went ahead, yeah. Yeah. especially your key stakeholders. And that's why the this type of program, the change management thing, this, this whole change management concept needs to begin from the start, right? And and we need to be telling the, these executive stakeholders, you know, need to understand that, that uh, you've gone ahead and you've signed off on the dotted line. You've gone ahead and you've implored to your leadership that, hey, we need to, your CFO, your board, we need to make this investment. Why wouldn't they want to make sure that you're getting a return on that investment? And we need to be very clear that part of your ability to get a return on your investment is for you as the executive sponsor to drive the change, right? And and when I and back to what I said about enabling, you enable them by providing them with the tools to drive that change. Here's a communications pyramid. Here's a, a what's in it for me. Here's a here's some copy that you can send out to the troops to help them understand why we're making this change and you know the case for change. And there's all of these tools that are part of the change management toolkit that we as customer success managers should be be providing to those leaders but they ultimately need to drive the change and they should want to drive the change. It's not I, just about I making their, their star rise, but it's also about making it's about making them look good and, and avoiding yeah. the negative impact of, Hey, you bought off on this thing. Why isn't your team using it? I've been using this analogy lately. It's uh, the sales team sells a vision, right? And it's a, it's some light show, right? That's this wonderful thing that's going to happen at some point in time implementation is going to plug in all the connectors, but customer success is what's really going to make the light show actually turn out the way yeah. that it's supposed to. And yeah. and until you're getting to the light show, everything is still just implementations. Yeah, exactly. Ashley, hopefully that, um, that answered your question. By the way, just as a reminder, we do go, we'll, we will go as late as 15 past the hour. So if you have to drop at the top of the hour, uh, you can check on the website and, and, uh, and usually by Tuesday next week, uh, we'll have the, the complete recording and transcription up there. Uh, otherwise, if you can stick around, uh, we'll keep answering questions in, until, uh, until there are none left. So, uh, Ashley, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, Davia, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Davia. Davia asks, what if the product works, but the client encounters challenges with tech support in the form of timely responses? How can you help your client shift the focus on the value of the product, which they have confirmed that they've received and create an advocate in, in despite of this minor challenge? Natalie, looks like you want to jump in on this. Yes, of course. Um, thanks for the question here. Uh, I think number one thing is right there, it's, it's a hot potato. So empathy is going to help you right off the bat, right? So card number one, uh, you can't be expected as a CSM to change the way or the operational way that your support team works, right? Uh, it all depends on your resources, the headcount, so on and so forth. But what you can do as a CSM, when this comes in, of course, use you know empathy, you understand their concern, and then you're the front line. You're basically the quarterback that's right there to be able to go internally to the either the head of your support team, to the person who has that support case under their name, and then question them and say, hey, I'm about to have a call with a customer or I had a call with this customer. This has been pending for 73 hours. Um, do you have any update, uh, you know, without throwing them under the bus? Uh, and then they'll, they'll start, you know, interacting with you. Uh, remember, you're also a point of escalation, right? So as you reach out to the person who's answering that support case, and as if you don't have that answer right now, you go above them to make sure you have that answer. You come back with an answer to the customer and say, hey, you should go back into the support portal. And within the next hour, you will have an answer. Next time, Mr. Customer, you sense a sense of urgency and that our support team, it might not be answering that quick. Call me. That's what a CSM does, right? I'll be able to help you. So hopefully, eventually, you know, the support team will get a little bit better at that. But don't put that onto your shoulder to fix how they work and you know resources that that's you know another another long story but once again empathy go into the support case reach out to the person who was taking care of the support go to the support manager and then you know create some uh, cadence or a follow-up they will see value right there they will see that you are attached to that product 
and ma- and make sure and make sure to apologize for the situation. You're not oh, apologizing. Course, yeah. You're not taking ownership. I just posted something this week on LinkedIn about how important it is that we apologize. Uh, by apologizing, we're not necessarily owning the problem. We're apologizing for the situation, though. Correct. And that's part of the empathy muscle as well, right? Yeah. Although it's there's that a... phrase, it's not. Go ahead, go ahead, Josh. Real quick. Sorry, very quick, Jeff. It's that phrase, it's not my fault, but it is my problem. And I'm going to work on fixing that. I think that that's a very powerful statement to be able to make. Yeah. And you want to create advocates? You want to create advocates? Advocates come from people who feel that you're looking out for their best interests, that that uh, you're on their mm-hmm. side, that you understand their perspective and apologizing for a situation, once again, isn't owning that, isn't, you're not, you're not, you're not taking blame for it. You're apologizing for the yeah. situation. You're expressing empathy, right? You understand that they're frustrated. And, and that is a big part of brokering that relationship of opening up that, that channel of communication, which is a step towards advocacy. Mm-hmm. They're well, never going to be an advocate if they don't trust you. I always do caution, though, especially with the the nature of customer success managers at times, not to apologize for the wrong things and becoming overly apologetic. Agreed. Agreed. That's that's a very for some people that is a very, very like it's a it's a sharp turning point that they that they apologize, apologize, and then they're apologizing for everything. And you have to understand that there's a power to sometimes not apologizing, but just framing it and it like renouncing the situation or re-announcing the situation. Like, here's what we faced and what we just went through. But let's talk about what we're going to do to solve it. Now, I, and, I, I yeah. agree with you. I agree with yeah. you. You have to be careful. There's a fine line, and that's why I qualified it with, I'm apologizing for the situation that you're going through. Right? But you're, to your point, yes, you can't be apologizing for everything. 100% agree. Uh, we've got one, uh, one last question from Christy, who's still stuck around. Thank you, Christy. You stuck around for, for uh, so let's make sure we answer your question. Has anyone ran a campaign in the SMB market to capture stories advocacy when you can't reach out to every customer in a one-on-one conversation? We have great NPS. We need to capture some of their stories and success to recognize them and share. Christy, we, I, I mentioned it a couple of times. We do that with G2 Crowd. We, we do not reach out. This is, it's, it's a fully automated um, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, email s- script and we reach out to folks via email, ask them to, um, uh, to, to, uh, uh, share their, their feedback, their thoughts on G2. Uh, and we now, I think we have a, f- a few hundred, uh, posts on G2. Um, I'm going to check now because it, it'll bug me if I don't. Anybody else have any, any thoughts on how to, uh, on Chrissy? Chrissy's question. I think you're right. Leveraging marketing, leveraging automated tools, scale tools, um, and and teams like your marketing team are going to be really important for that. Yeah, and that's all delivered through our marketing function. So we now have we have 352 reviews, four and a half stars. That's awesome. Four point seven stars. I mean, that's that's and that was driven. That was that was pure, you know, purely driven by, by email marketing or email uh, customer marketing. Um, awesome. Any, uh, we're out of questions. We're out of questions. Any other questions? Any, any, any other final thoughts that you, uh, that you all, that you all have? Uh, I mean, I would say just focus on the long goal of creating a group of advocates and then developing a program around it. It's it's really easy to stay aligned with just a short goal of saying we have a couple of good advocates here and there and then always leaning on them because you can exhaust them too. So, you know, continue to find that repeti- the rep- repetitive moment that you have with these customers and what your resources activate for them to become uh, advocates and then put that in. And a good point yeah. Jeff just made, it's important also not to overuse your yeah. true advocacy. So the more that you have, you better. And also keep them in a place within it, whether it's in Salesforce or in Gainsight, an area where people can see per market, per industry, per product, you know, what type of advocacy that they have, whether it's a use case or a reference call. The more that you have in your database, then your sales team is able to filter and then reach out to the CSM and say, hey, I'd like to pinpoint this customer. May I use them as a reference? 
you know how many times they've been used or yep. you're not used, but I mean, you know, referred to. So that's also key. You know, organizations sometimes will stop with five or 10 main references or advocacy. And then <laughs> it's the same people for 10 years. Like, right. no, we need out. more. Mm -hmm. wear, them wear them out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Awesome. The only thing I'll add is uh, there's intentionality to all of this, right? So do it on purpose. Do it with uh, with clear intent and communicate effectively around it. Otherwise, it's it's always going to be haphazard and potentially messy. Awesome, uh, Jody, uh, stick around for a second. I'll answer your question, but I want to I want to close things out here. We're at the end of the, do uh, the at our time today, so and I think it was a great conversation. But it's not what I think; it's what all of you think. So please let us know by posting your feedback on LinkedIn and tagging either myself or our guests. Uh, or success coaching. I want to thank my amazing panelists uh, for spending the time with us and for the ideas, thoughts, insights, best practices that you shared. Uh, appreciate the time. Uh, one final note, great CSMs know they don't have all the answers, but they know where to get them. And that's why we created the CSM Mastermind program to harness the knowledge and experience of the community to help improve everyone. We hope to see you again at our next event on April 20th when we'll discuss having difficult conversations with Anita Toth from Churn Crusher, Carla Kanan from Birch Street Systems, and Jonathan Davis from Cobalt.io. Until then, make sure to sp make space for yourself and your mindset every single day. Have a great rest of your day, week, and month, everyone, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, hey, you guys, wait, Thank wait, you, wait, everyone. Wait it was until, a pleasure. Wait until Ashley gives us the, uh, the all clear, okay? Yep. Uh, cause we got to wait till we, uh, unsync with, with LinkedIn, uh, Jody, um, I recommend the change pyramid, uh, when it makes sense. All right. There's a bunch of tools, all right. There's the change pyramid. There's the, uh, com communications pyramid. There's a case for change. There's, uh, there's the with them, uh, you know, and, and so I, I think there, are, you want to use those tools based off of what you are, are trying to convey. Uh, but we're we're huge fans of change management. Using change management strategies to drive adoption. Uh, as a matter of fact, we we have a we have a a couple of programs on that. We have a self paced uh, online learning uh, change management program as well as a uh, instructor led online learning uh, program that is uh, or instructor led boot camp that is uh, um, that was built by the same partner that built our online content. So, uh, yeah, go ahead and yeah, ch check it out. It's it's on the website Success Coaching. Uh, dot co thanks everybody thanks for joining us